It's been a busy month. It's not quite up yet in both ways. I was thinking about the end of last month to where we are now. We've um, had three really important holidays, Memorial Day, the end of last month, Father's Day, and Juneteenth in succession that they came. Um, it's funny because I was looking at the three of them, and i got to move this. It's not. All three of them, when you look at them biblically, have the essence of John 15. Greater love has no one than a man that would lay down his life for his brother. Memorial Day, that, that right there speaks for itself. Um, you know, I can't say enough about our veterans, both the ones that are here and the ones that we've lost, the ones that we've never knew, the ones that fought for our freedom, the first part of free, dumb, is not free. It, it was cost. It was of a great cost. The same as our salvation was of a great cost. Father's Day. Anyone knows that to father, what it means to put your own desires aside if you're a good father for your children. So that verse comes into play there also. And Juneteenth. When I think of Juneteenth, I think of hope. But there were a lot of people, color aside, that put down their life for that to happen. It was funny because the other weekend, I had Izzy, and Jenna was working her way back to the house, and um, I jumped the gun, got there a little bit too quick, so I took her down to the park, and Izzy's is playing in them running around as she's playing through the different apparatuses and car pulls up and a woman gets out with her son and then later on an older lady gets out and the old lady comes up to me and says hello and I said hello to her and she looked at me she said so have you had a chance to celebrate Juneteenth this weekend and it wasn't said with well let me get this white woman because she probably didn't even know what Juneteenth was it was said with hope that another human being was sharing in a holiday that was important to her. And before I knew it, we were having this conversation that just, it's like the world just fell away. Yeah, I was still watching Izzy. She was still watching her daughter and her grandson. But we just, it's like we had known each other for years. I'm standing there with my phone in my hand and talking to her, my daughter had called me umpteen times. She finally gave up and just came to the park. You know, Later I got the messages, Mom, are you dropping Izzy off? Do you want me to come to the park? Mom. So then when Jenna gets there, um, I go to introduce her, and I realize I don't even know this woman's name. And uh, her name's Lisa. <laughs> How cool is God? But, uh, you know, as Pastor Milton said here last week, you know, it's about family. It's about joy. It's about hope. And if you look at all three of those holidays, they kind of fall along the same line. Memorial Day, if it wasn't for hope, if it wasn't for family, if it wasn't for love, if it wasn't for unity, fathers, all these things, they, they, they just all kind of go together, in my mind at least. You know, the young men that grew up and they want to be a soldier, whether there's a war on or not, did they know where they were going to wind up in the end? How many fathers? Um, it was a vision of a child, whether if it was planned or not knew what, they w what would happen in the end, how they'd wind up with their children, how their children would be, what directions they would take. Juneteenth, the hope, the hope of freedom, the hope of someday things are going to be different. I, I just, it just amazed me when I, when I looked at these three holidays, how the three of them in succession and, and how they all three are, are similar. I heard a thing today about Harry Beecher Stowe, who wrote the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
She, um, some people believe that she wrote it because her 18-month-old son died and she realized the loss and thought of the slaves that had their children snatched from them. But I heard a different perspective today that during communion service, she had a vision of a slave being beaten. And that's what prompted her to write this book. When she wrote the book, they didn't think that it was going to do anything. They almost didn't want to publish it. And by the time it was published, it was in almost every American home the same as the Bible, up to and including the president. When the president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, met her, his quote was, and I had to write this down so I'd get it right, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that brought this great war. So today I want to talk to you about dreams, visions, thoughts, and what God wants. It's said that if your dreams don't make you wet your pants, they're not big enough. Because we serve a very big God. And if that makes you mad, we don't serve the same God or you don't understand how much your God loves you. As a parent, you ever notice how life's going along and, and you, you get through the last hump that whatever disaster that's fallen on your family and you're paying your bills, you're going to work, the kids seem to not be fighting, they seem to be doing okay, no calls from the school, and it's like, okay, I'm getting dinner ready, I got the wash done, all the, all the things that you do as a, as a mother, sometimes as a father, you know, the grass gets mowed, this gets mowed, all these things get done, and all of a sudden, one of your kids comes up. Mom? can I have a dirt bike? And all of a sudden, your whole world just goes, Vroom. and you're thinking, well, okay, yeah, you know, I mean, a little Mototech 50cc, I pick it up new for a little over 500. We could do that. You know, there's a space in the yard. He's old enough. She's old enough. Okay, I could, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I may be able to pick one up used, maybe a couple hundred dollars, yeah, dad could work on it. I'll talk to him, I think that, you know, so you got all these thoughts in your mind, and you're like, okay, this, this could be doable. I, didn't, I don't like the idea, you know, I mean, God, we haven't put anything on the insurance in a long time. I just, all right, well, you know, and you kind of start to acquiesce to it, and then your child says, yeah, I was thinking about a gas, gas, M." C450F, okay, the top speed on the little moto is 20 miles an hour, and this one's 60 miles an hour. The moto tech is new $500, and this one is over 12 grand. You ever notice how your kid's visions of something is just a little bit different than yours, and it always takes you someplace you weren't really ready or didn't want to go? Sometimes I wonder if that's how God feels. Oh, what are they asking for now? I can't give them that because of this. You get the guy and he's like, Lord, this, this woman here, she is the one. And God's like, uh-uh. Uh-uh. <laughs> and he prays every night. Lord, I, I just, I don't even know how I could take another breath unless she stands beside me as my wife. And the Lord's like, yeah, but I hear her thoughts. I, I see her, what she does when you don't see her. She is not the one. The same for the girl. Lord, this man, he is a man of God. And the Lord's going, mm-mm, <laughs> uh-uh. But your prayers don't get answered. So it's like, well, do I really want to pray? Because it might not get answered. Well, how much time do we spend on the reason why it's not getting answered? It might be like the, the uh, gas, gas, and the mototech, you know? I mean, there's, there's a big division there. God knows what we're ready for. I just got done listening to a very good book, and you all have probably heard of it or read it. Uh, it's called The Hiding Place. And there are so many gems in that book. I would recommend anybody to get it and read it because it is just really an awesome book. There was a wo woman, Cory Tambaum, and she 
was hiding Jews with her family during the Holocaust in Holland. And, of course, they were found out, and they got taken to the concentration camp. Her father died probably, like, I think within a month after, and it just left her and her sister. And um, there was one part in the book where, and, I mean, they had been starved. They had been beaten just as if they were Jews because in the Germans' eyes, they were just as bad. They had gone up against Hitler. Um, and they were praying. And they were, the room that they were in, I'm starting to scratch, was filled with fleas. And they were tormented by these night and day. And as they were thanking God for things and thinking of things to thank God for, now, mind you, they are starved. They were given, like, a potato and some kind of turnip broth for dinner. And, you know, I mean, they're, they're skin and bones. Their clothes are ragged. They're freezing in the winter. They're sweltering in the summer. You know, they're, they're finding things to thank God for. And her sister says, we have to thank God for the fleas. Her sister, Betsy, who when you read the book, everybody talks about Corey, but Betsy was the spiritual one in the beginning through this whole thing. And Betsy says, we have to thank God for the fleas. And Corey's like, are you kidding me? And she said, the Bible says, thank God through all things. So they thank God for the fleas. One, I think, more in Zubert than the other. And later on in the story, it talked about they got transferred to this one department where the guards that were beating them and tormenting them didn't come in the room. And they didn't come in the room because that room was infested with fleas. It's just so amazing to me when I hear stories like this of how God works. You know, we, we judge things, and I know I'm comparing people to fleas, but sometimes that's, that's a pretty good comparison. We judge people on how they are, what they do, why they do what they do, why they look like they look, and we, we form opinions. But it's like the guy or the girl that's praying for the future spouse, and they don't know the intentions of that person's heart, but they are the one. They are the one. And God sees the whole picture. He hears everyone's thoughts. He sees everyone what they do in their private time, and he knows that is not the one. So when we look at somebody and we come up with a conclusion of who we think they are, why we think they are, we, we judge their worth, we're not God. And we're making a big mistake. You can be dead on and uh, you can say, oh, wow, that, that person's a thief, I can tell. And you may be right, they may steal something, but you don't know their heart. And I'm not condoning stealing. I'm just saying you do not know circumstances. You do not know agendas. And you do not know their heart because the Bible says we don't even know our heart. I heard another story the other day, and it, it kind of brought back this to me. There was a, and I don't know if this is true or not, it, it was a cruise ship, and a husband and wife got on it. And they left their four kids with the grandparents. And they were on the cruise ship, and there was a storm, and the boat starts to sink. So they both rush to the life uh, boats, and the husband jumps on the boat because there was only room for one more. And the wife says something to him. And they said, what do you think the wife was saying to him? And, of course, people were like, you, mm, I married you through love, and look what you do to me, blah, 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 blah. Her last words to him before the ship sank was, take care of our children. And you th may think, well, you know, I don't know what year this was, but, you know, she's a woman, he's the breadwinner, he would take care of the kids. You know, you can rationalize this however you want in your mind, or you can think that, that low life, whatever. However you rationalize it in your mind. Years later, one of his four children was looking through his diary. She was furious with her father. She couldn't stand him for the fact that he let their mother go down with the ship. She read in his diary, that fateful day, it was all I could do to get on that boat. 
I wanted so badly to go down with you to spend our last minutes together as we had our life. If it hadn't been for your diagnosis of terminal cancer, I would have stayed on that ship and let our grandparents raise our kids. What a perspective. Nobody ever thought of that. But yet, every one of us had judged that man. Why did you let your wife drown and you got on the lifeboat? You know, I say these things just to give thought to how we come to conclusions with people. But back to hopes and dreams. When we dream dreams, how big are they? And what kind of boundaries do we put on them? You know, I imagine if that story was even true about the lifeboat and the cruise. Those people had dreams at one time, and they never thought that they would end up where they were. The husband raising the kids, kids thinking ill thoughts of him because of his decision. If our dreams are not big, they don't push us. If we have big dreams and they fall in line with what God wants, amazing things can happen. A little woman that had a dream, a vision, and wrote a book, and then the President of the United States has a conversation with her about a major, a major historical war that put a division between this country, between brother and brother, between color and color, between states and states that changed our whole direction and actually started to put things on a right path where they never should have been to begin with from a woman's dream, a woman's vision. And then I think about Noah. In the middle of the desert, building an ark, no one had ever seen rain before. To have it rain was pee to them. They didn't, they didn't know what rain was. It hadn't fallen from the sky. They knew dew, but they didn't know rain. Why is this man building this thing in the middle of the desert? I mean, people were coming in the air. They were doing the labor on it because they were getting paid. Sometimes God asks us to do things, and we're like, do you know this is 2023? I can't do that. I can't say that. I can't be that. That'll never get done. But when the waters came from under the earth and rose and people screamed to get on the boat, maybe they wished at that point that they had shared that vision. It's hard to share a vision with someone if you don't, if it didn't, if it isn't part of your spectrum, your dream. I want to ask you something, and this is a rhetorical question. You know, I, I, I don't want anybody to, to answer me. It's just to impress. It's not for an answer. But when God does something, do you, like something you prayed for or just something out of the blue, Do you, A, go, oh, my, I can't believe that happened? Or do you go, do you rather affirm it with a fact that, yeah, that's my God? I know myself, I go back and forth. There's times I pull into a supermarket, boom, there's a parking place right up front, and I'm like, yes, thank you, Jesus. You know, the, the, the little things like the parking spot versus a great big huge thing, whatever's monumental in your life, are the exact same to God. He's already said a second is a thousand years, a, a penny is a million dollars. I mean, it's just, in essence, what he's saying is it's all nothing to me. I can either choose to do it or not choose to do it. It's not like a 4,000-pound meteor made of solid gold dropping in the yard of this church to, to fulfill any dreams that this church wanted to do. God could do that like that. It wouldn't be a burden. It wouldn't be, but would it fall into his plan? 
That's the part that we miss, and that's the part that we find disappointment in because we have these ideals. And if, Lord, if I had this, I could do this, and then this would happen, and then this would happen. And we have this succession of things that we think are going to go along. But God knows, okay, there's a storm coming. There's this coming. That's not going to happen because of this. If I give you money to plant banana trees in Dover, Delaware, because you're going to make this crop and it's going to make tens of thousands of dollars and then you can do this for my ministry, it's not going to happen. Could God make it happen? Absolutely. Could God have that be a banana field and make that man millions of dollars? Absolutely. If it doesn't fall in God's plans, it's not going to happen. And that's where we get disappointed. And that's where we sit back and say, well, I prayed and my prayers weren't answered. So then when you get into that thing of a prayer a day to keep the devil away, and I'm just doing this because I, it's, I know I have to do it, and you lose your hope, you lose your dream, you lose your vision. And I think that's part of what helps drive our faith. If you have faith in something, the Bible says faith without works is dead, and it is. I can have faith for that meteor-sized ball of gold to fall out in the parking lot. Yeah, it'll crush the parking lot, but I'll be daggone sure to be able to get a new one. Um, but if I lose my faith on that vision of what I'm going to do with that, if I lose my faith, if I lose my vision of actually visualizing it and seeing it, In a form, I'm doubting God, which is a great sin. Now, once again, if it's not part of God's plan, it is not going to happen. But I've heard stories of tennis stars that take a tennis ball and actually just stare at it for hours at a time. They say that any, any hobby, any craft, anything you want to be good at, it takes 10,000 hours to be a master at. And that's probably true. So we got some time to put in our prayer life, some serious time, and not just the prayer day to keep the devil away, but the real prayer, the talking to your father. When you know how much he loves you and you know how much he wants the best for you, whether we perish in this or not, the honor of being a part of his plan, to me, just solidifies the whole thing. Do I want to die? No. I want to go on and do great things for the kingdom of God, but I'm not going to do that sitting here going, well, I prayed for this and it didn't happen. I prayed for this and it didn't happen. And I remember one time when we were early on married, I had a lot of devastating personal things happen to me. And Richie came up to me one time and he said, what are you dreaming for now? And I looked at him with tears in my eyes and I said, I don't dream anymore because it hurts too much. I can't handle it when I dream and I pray for things and it just, I seem to get the opposite. I've grown a little bit since then. I still get my little snits and my little sport. Why is this God didn't give it to me? But, and then another thing with Richie and I, I've always gotten kind of bristled when he asked me stuff like that because I've always been a private person. I don't know if it's like most of my life I was raised as an only child and I always consider my thoughts private and that kind of thing. You know, so, so what are you thinking? It's like, what do you mean what I'm thinking? You know, but... Yeah, which, you know, I should be honored to have a husband that cares about my thoughts, but, you know, my personal rises up, and I go, what do you mean, what am I thinking? But uh, we should all have dreams and keep praying on them and acting on them and believing on them and drawing plans for them. And you know what? You can draw a plan for something and work on it and work towards it, and if it's not in God's plan, if you let him, he's going to steer you to where your plans and his plans line up. The Bible says so, and the Bible doesn't lie. 
So then when you look at your dream and you had your dream over here and it was this and this was the greatest thing and if this just doesn't happen, I don't know what I'm going to do because I'm just putting everything I have into this and it turns out to be here. And then you look at it and you go, wow, I never knew this could be this. Because you let God lead you. And as you were hoping and as you were dreaming and as you were wanting and as you were planning and manifesting this and drawing pictures of it and doing diagrams and, and financial plans and, and everything that you need to do to get something to manifest, you were praying through it and you were seeking God's wisdom and you were seeking his face and his will. And then you look back and you go, this wasn't even what I thought it was going to be. This is so much better. <laughs> Gee, who would know that the, the God that created the universe could really make my plans better than what I thought? Man, when they say we were stiff-necked people, they really didn't. <laughs> Sometimes I think, well, they, you know, the old saying, if you, if you want God to laugh, you tell him your plans. But even our thoughts and how we process things, he's got to kind of go, okay, well, we're going to do it this way. <laughs> and thank God he does. Because I think of some of the things that I've prayed for and I've hoped for and I've dreamed for over my lifetime that didn't come true. And I had the boo-boo lip and I kicked the rock and I smashed things and carried on and acted like a child. And now I'm like, oh, thank God that didn't happen. But I was going to die if it didn't. Very breath was going to leave my lungs if I didn't get these things, if these things didn't happen. Just like the child with the, with the dirt bike. You know, you, you think of these little things that they want, and, and you think of them as trivial, and to them, they're magnanimous. Just like what we ask God for. You know, and sometimes it's things that really are important to us. You can't make your mortgage. You can't make your rent. You can't make your car payment. You can't, there's hospital bills that are surmounting. There's things that are going on in your life that, that you, you're not willing to sacrifice and you find out that you're going to have to. And you think, in the loss of that, Lord, what was the greater good? In this side of heaven, we may not know. But we got to be part of his plan. And to me, that's everything. I am part in my mistakes in my hopes, in my dreams, in my visions, in my prayers, I am part of the creator of the universe's plans for this whole kabam. That's as much as of an honor as when I say my prayers in the morning and I announce to the universe that I am the child of the most high God, the only God. I'm a part of his plan, even with my mistakes. The Bible says he makes our mistakes to prosper. So every little thing that I do, when I get up and I go out in the day, if I go to Walmart and just on the spur, everything I do is a part of God's plan. Wow. So I want to encourage everybody, don't, don't let your dreams fall by the way. Don't, don't let them go aside. Don't give up on them. Be amazed when they change. Be amazed when they change you. The essence of you and who you are and who you thought you were, and you're thinking, wow, I started out here and I was this person, and I feel like a totally different person. I feel changed. You were, because you put your faith in the person that created you. Well, that's all I have for today. If Rich will shut this down, then I have something for the company.